no creator need apply. The uh, story I am going to tell uh, partly comes from uh, The Independent in the, Un in the United Kingdom. And uh, it's um, an entitled, or it's, it's subtitled, A Scientific Paper Which Says the Human Hand Was Designed by a Creator Sparks Controversy. Uh, the paper's perceived references to intelligent design have provoked anger and calls for a boycott of the journal. And this is by Doug Bolton on the, uh, March, the 3rd of March in 2016. The article begins, a recent scientific paper in the movement of the human hand has faced strong criticism for referring to a creator throughout. The paper, titled Biomechanical Characteristics of Hand Coordination and Grasping Activities of Daily Living, was written by a team of four researchers, three from Huazhong University in China and one from Worcester Polytechnic Institute in Massachusetts. Published in, PLOS One, in the PLOS One journal, the fairly conventional study looked at the mechanics of how we grasp things and involved the measurement of the hand movement of 30 participants. However, Members of the scientific community have demanded the paper be retracted for its several perceived references to the pseudoscientific theory of intelligent design and a possibly design, divine creator. In the opening sentences of the study, it claims the link between muscles and hand movements is a product of, quote, pop, proper design by the creator. Later, it says human hand coordination should indicate the mystery of the creator's invention and concluded by, again, claiming the mechanical architecture of the hand is the result of proper design by the creator. Uh, some of the tweets that were involved, thanks PLOS One for feeding arguments to those who say open access equals lower quality. The Creator Gate article, Creator Gate, hmm, is a harmful disgrace. Um, and then just found out PLOS One published a paper with evidence about some creator. If not retracted immediately, I will resign as editor. Apparently, uh, as part of the rest of PLOS. Um, by the way, those who are curious, PLOS means Public Library of Science. The hand coordination should indicate the mystery of the creator. I knew PLOS one wasn't top tier, but really, so bad. And that's some of the Twitter stuff. We'll be looking at some of the other reactions. Um, Naturally, multiple references to intelligent design in a reputable journal like PLOS One have stoked anger in the scientific community, and many people, including researchers who work as editors for the publication, are now calling for it to be retracted. The paper's authors appeared to acknowledge their mistakes in the comments section, saying that references to the creator were down to translation errors rather than a belief in intelligent design. Other comments on the paper called its publication unacceptable criti and criticized the sloppy job done by the reviewers and editors. Some scientists said that the journal should be boycotted unless amends are made. Commenting, commenting below the study, the journal staff apologized that the language occurring to a creator was not addressed during the paper's evaluation. They also said they were looking into the concerns raised and would take steps to correct the published article. Update, the journal has now announced the paper will be retracted. Commenting on the website, it wrote, the PLOS One editors have followed up in the comments raised about this publication. We have completed an evaluation of the history of the submission and received advice from two experts in our editorial board. Our internal review and the advice we received have confirmed the concerns about the article and revealed that the peer review process did not adequately evaluate several aspects of the work. Several. In light of the concerns identified, the PLOS One editors have decided to retract the article and the retraction is being processed and will be posted as soon as possible. We apologize for the errors and oversight leading to the publication of this paper. Well, what kind of paper is that? Well, it's Biomechanical Characteristics of Hand Coordination and Grasping Activities of Daily Living, PLOS One, and as of uh, two days ago, it was still available on the net, um, all, albeit with a retraction in front. Uh, the retraction 
also is published by the PLOS One staff in uh, uh, HTTP, well, anyway, P1. Um, so let's look at the article itself. Hand coordination can allow humans to have dexterous control with many degrees of freedom to perform various tasks in daily living. An important contributing factor to this important ability is the complex biomechanical architecture of the human hand. However, drawing a clear functional li link between biomechanical architecture and hand coordination is challenging. It is not understood which biomechanical characteristics are responsible for hand coordination and what specific effect each biomechanical characteristic has. To explore this link, we first, this is still the abstract, I inspected the characteristics of hand coordination during the daily task through a statistical analysis of the kinematic data, which were collected from 30 right-handed subjects during a multitude of grasping tasks. Then the functional link between biomechanical architecture and hand coordination was drawn by establishing the clear, clear corresponding causality between the tenderness connective characteristics of the human hand and the coordinated characteristics during daily grasping activities. The Continuing, the explicit functional link indicates that the biomechanical characteristics of tendinous connective tissue architecture between muscles and articulations is the proper design by the creator to perform a multitude of daily tasks in a comfortable way. The clear link between the structure and the function of the human hand also suggests that the design of a multifunctional robotic hand should be able to better imitate such basic architecture. So maybe if we figure this out, we can make better robots. Introduction. I'm not going to read the whole thing, as you will see, but uh, enough to give you a flavor for what the article's about. The human hand is an amazing instrument that can perform a multitude of functions, such as the power grasp and precision grasp of a variety of objects, vast array of objects. The excellent behaviors of the human hand are enabled by a highly complex structure with 19 articulations, 31 muscles, and more than 25 degrees of freedom. While the abundant functions are favorable, that's interesting, I think that's English, this uh, complex structure also raises a challenging problem of how the human body controls such a large number of mechanical degrees of freedom with ease and an absence of effort. Studies indicate that digits do not move alone in isolation of adjacent digits during functional activity, even when a specific movement requires an individual digit. On the contrary, the movements of multiple digits are correlated and the movement information of the human hand is redundant so that only a small number of components account for most variances. The human hand uh, adopts coordinated movements to reduce the number of independent degrees of freedom and simplify the complexity of the control problem. Thus, hand coordination affords humans the ability to flexibly and comfortably control the complex structure to perform numerous tasks. Hand coordination should indicate the mystery of the creator's invention. Uh, there's the second reference to the creator. There are two main factors that contribute to hand coordination neurological functions and biomechanical constraints. The neurological functions are controlled by the central nervous system. And again, I'm not reading the whole thing. Compared to the neurological functions, knowledge of the complex biomechanical architecture is more crucial to understanding hand coordination because mechanical functions can af afford affect motor commands. In the human hand, a single muscle does not always connect to a single articular uh, but rather has a unique connective architecture between muscles and articulation, such as the interconnection of a multi-tendon muscle with several articulations. The uh, uh, extensor and the flexor di uh, digitalum profundus come to mind in this regard. Although many researchers have noted the effect of the biomechanical constraints on hand coordination, Few have found a clear link between the biomechanical architecture and hand coordination. In this paper, we will explore such a functional link. Sounds like a reasonable paper, right? Except for that creator stuff. Um,
Before establishing the clear link between biomechanical architecture and hand coordination, we studied the characteristics of the coordinated movements of the human hand during grasping activities in daily living. As far as we know, considerable attentions have been devo devoted, again, I think that's English, uh, to investigating the characteristics of the coordinated relationships between fingers or joints using a multivariate statistical analysis of the kinematic data which were collected from subjects during tasks or a period of natural movements. However, in most of these studies, the movement data are gathered from only a few grasping types while not covering various grasp tasks in daily life as much as possible. So we're going to do better. As discussed in this paper, the human hand adopts a dis distinctive co coordinated control strategy for each task. It is apparent to get different coordinated relationships between joints from the movement data compiled by different tasks. Thus, we connected kinematic data from a sufficient number of tasks, which represent a variety of grasp tasks in daily life as much as possible, to explore the basic coordination, coordinated relationship between the joints. In addition, cluster analysis was used to determine a network and detailed coordinated relationship among joints. After determining the basic characteristics of coordinated movement, we tried to find clear corresponding evidence of coordinated relationships from the biomechanical characteristics of muscular articular connective art architecture and to establish the functional link between biomechanical architecture and the characteristics of hand coordination. The muscular articular connective architecture of the human hand is responsible for the basic dexterous control strategy for various tasks. This study explored a method to identify the proper explanation for the hand architecture of muscular articular connections from the analysis of behavioral result. Again, a little English. Materials and methods, task paradigm. In daily use, grasping is the most common function of the human hand. The human hand can grasp different objects of a vast range of sizes and shapes. People are more concerned with the task they wanted to accomplish than the sizes and shapes of ob objects in terms of the choice of grasp. This suggests that grasp could be categorized according to tasks instead of appearance. Napier uh, mentioned uh, power grasp and precision grasp. The former is characterized by an application of force with a large contact area between objects and the hand surface. In the latter, the objects are dexterously held with the tips of the fingers and the thumb. Further subdivisions, based on the details of the task in terms of which group of fingers exerted force on the object and which part of the finger contacted the object, um, Fike developed, uh, whatever the, however he pronounces his name or she, developed a comprehensive taxonomy. In particular, it's, I guess it's he, he considered the distinctiveness of the thumb and expanded the taxonomy to 33 different ta task types as shown in S1 figure, which we're going to look at in just a minute. This finite taxonomy is able to allow a better description of the capabilities of the human hand. Therefore, the Feig's ta taxonomy was chosen as our task paradigm. And here's some of the things that are grasped as you can see, you know, you can have your thumb up, your thumb down, um, and uh, all kinds of different things that you can grasp. Subjects, uh, 30 asymptomatic subjects, 15 male and 15 females, 25 years old on average, participated in the experiment after providing written informed consent. This is not exactly dangerous, so I'm sure this flew right past a IRB. Uh, none of the subjects had any known history of neurological or musculoskeletal problems that might affect their hand function, so they're not abnormal. But also, uh, they also possess no particular hand skill as a result of work or leisure activities, such as being proficient in playing the piano. They wanted people who just, ordinary people, I guess. The subjects were all right-handed. Experimental procedure subjects were seated near the edge of a table and placed their right arm on the table in a comfortable position. They were or posture. They were instructed to perform 33 types of tasks uh, using a large number of objects which were chosen from the most common objects in daily life and had a large range of sizes and shapes. In each type of task, the subjects were asked to grasp three objects of different sizes or shapes separately, and then each test was repeated on every object three times to depress random error. Um, 
an instrumented glove, cyber glove, virtual technologies, Paleo Alto, California, with um, embedded resistive bend sensors was used to measure the joint angles of the hand during the grasping movement. And here's a, a data analysis. And as I mentioned previously, they use this glove. Um, and there's the there's the picture of the the different places that were being measured, and uh, they uh, measure various angles and, and also rotation in some cases. Principal component analysis was employed to, d to investigate the degree of coordinated behavior among the joints of the human hand. This dimensional reduction method transforms the original data set of correlated joint area angle variables into a linear combination of new uncorrelated variables called principal components. Then the principal components were ordered according to the percentage of variance explained by each component. And correlation analysis was used to determine the coordinated relationships between two joints. Uh, between joints. If two joints were coordinated, they would move synchronously with a certain relationship. We applied correlation analysis on different movement data sets composed of different tasks. At first, the movement data set for each task was used to determine the coordinated relationship between joints. There were 16 times 16 minus 1 divided by 2, or 120 variables of coordinated relationships between joints. Next, the movement uh, data sets for multiple tasks were pooled to, analyze, to analyze and, co and obtain the common coordinated relationships for these tasks. However, it was a time-consuming calculation to exhaust all possibilities because of the number of possible combinations, um, the number of possible combinations could reach 1.7 times 10 to the ninth when 16 types of tasks were chosen. Instead, we randomly selected 2,000 types from all possible combinations except the conditions of choosing one or two types of task, which would have led to less than 2,000 possibilities. The general evaluation of the coordinated relationships called the mean movement coordination was defined as, get ready, uh, <laughs> as you can see, it's uh, fairly complicated there. Um, after comparing movement coordinated re relationships between tasks, we used correlated an correlation analysis on the movement data set to explore various, uh, the basic coordinated relationships between any two joints for various tasks. Statistical analysis. To provide a statistical description, we performed statistical tests of our results in the coordinate, correlation analysis and clustering analysis. In the correlation analysis, a one-tailed pair T test was used to test whether the average value of the coordinated relationship in one task was significantly higher or lower than in another task. Interesting, they chose one-tailed rather than two-tailed, but um, comparison of results, degree of coordinated mo movements among joints. Uh, among other things, the percentage of variance accounted for the joint angles by each successive PC diminishes progressively, and the first two uh, PCs can uh, retain most of the movement information of the original joint variable. For example, the first three PCs accounted for 80 3.4% of the variance, and the first seven PCs account for nearly 96.4, that is to say, greater than 95% of the uh, uh, variance. This demonstrates that the movement data sets of joint angles are hyper-redundant. You don't need every single one of them, and you, here you can see where the principal component, half of its uh, by one and another little over half of that is by the second one. And by the time you get down to 9 or 10, well, you already accounted for most of the variance. Comparison of the coordinated movement between tasks. The human hand coordinates multiple joints to dexterously perform different tasks in different ways. The dexterous control strategy for each task can be described by the specific coordinated movement between joints, as shown in Figure 3, which we'll see in a minute. The values of 120 coordinated variables by pairwise combinations of 16 joints are distributed on, along the ring circle in each radar chart in Figure 3. And here's some of those radar charts. And you can see for different uh, that there is some 
coordination, although uh, differences depending on what you're doing. Interestingly, the uh, holding of the ring seems to give you uh, disparity between uh, uh, joints that are near each other. Not only for a single task, the joints of human hands are also coordinated during the movements of multiple joint tasks. The coordinated relationship between joints for these tasks are called common coordinated relationships and can be derived from the pooled movement data sets composed of these tasks. As discussed in the previous study, the previous study? Yeah, they did a previous study. Keep that in mind. And apparently it was published too. The human hand adopts a distinctive control strategy for each task and it is apparent to get different co common coordinated relationships between joints from the movement data sets, excuse me, uh, composed of different tasks. Uh, as discussed in the previous study, the human hand adopts a distinctive control strategy for each task and it is apparent to get different common coordinated relationships between joints from the movement data set composed of different tasks. Do constant and basic common coordinated relationships exist for the human hand when various tasks are performed? Do constant and basic common coordinated relationships, excuse me. Do, to answer this question, we studied the influence of richness of task type on the common coordinated relationships. When several tasks are chosen, the evaluation of index of mean movement coordination is employed to show the general movement coordinated relationships among joints. As shown in figure four, a significant trend is that coordination drops with an increase in the number of task types despite the individual differences. Which is not surprising. You do different things and your hand has to behave differently. When only one task is chosen, the value of the MMC is higher. However, the coordination drops rapidly when more tasks are added. This decrease of coordination indicates that the realization of more functions requires more independent movements. Well, duh. However, the coordination does not always decrease. The rate of decrease becomes quite slow, and the MMC values turn into invariableness when many tasks are included, especially when more than 20 task types of tasks are chosen, as shown in figure four, which is coming up here. You will notice that uh, that at first there's quite a bit of uh, decrease in the coordination as you add different tasks, but once you get out to uh, you know 24, 28, pretty well flattens out. That is to say, you do 20 different kinds of movements. The other 10 are pretty much the same as the ones before. Movement coordinated relationships between joints during all the tasks. Skipping over a little bit, the, the PIP joint of the ring finger and the PIP joint of the little finger first meet at a node um, among all joints. This, this denotes that the average coordination across subjects for these two joints is the highest among all combinations of joint pairs. Also the ring finger and the, and the middle finger. We can draw four main joint, uh, four main coordinated characteristics, I'm sorry, and those are yellow ellipses, they're mine, um, between joints during the movement of various tasks. First, an overall characteristic is that the joints of the four fingers are clustered into a group, while the joints of the thumb are clustered to one another. Second, the joints of the four fingers are divided into two clusters, the PIP and DIP joints and the MCP joints. Third, the movement of the joints of the index finger are distinct from the other joints of the middle ring and little fingers. Fourth, the PIP joints of the middle ring and little fingers are clustered into a group. This is not surprising. Your three outside fingers tend to move together. The main movement characteristics are consistent between females and males. That doesn't matter which sex you are. You pretty much use your hands the same way. Discussion, an important advantage that makes human hands superior to other animals. This is one of the things that raised hackles on the people who are reading this, by the way, is that the human hand can dexterously perform various tasks, and this unique ability can apparently facilitate the capacity for more effective tool making and tool use during the evolutionary process. Now, wait a minute. Wasn't it once a boast that we are the ape with opposable thumbs? Haven't you heard that before? 
Isn't that supposed to be special? So they're saying it's special, and they're getting dinged for it. Okay. To explore the dexterous ability of the human hand, we adopted the reverse research method, going from the result to the reason. In previous work, apparently referring to the other paper, we studied what basic movements characteristics are required for the human hand to perform multiple tasks dexterously. As shown in figure S4B of, of a Barbary ape hand, the four fingers and thumb are interconnected by these long tendons of the FDP muscle, the flexor digitorum profundus. However, in the great apes, that is Pongo, Gorilla, and Pan, the FDP tendon to the thumb is usually either vestigial or absent. In humans, the FDP muscle only attaches to the four fingers, while the thumb has a separate long flexor muscle in the form called the flexor pollicis longus, or FPL. The presence of the FPL is a specialization in humans and enormously increases the independence of the thumb. The movement characteristics of the human hand show that the thumb needs to be able to move independently of the other four fingers to perform various tasks. I mean, this is common knowledge, right? Fortunately, the presence of the FPL exactly satisfies the functional requirements and offers the human hand superior capabilities, there's that word superior again, Err. Um, to perform a variety of complex functions compared to other primates. Moving rapidly, in fact, each finger of the human hand has two different muscles to control the two joints separately. The better coordination, coordinated relationship is guaranteed by the specific structure of the extensor expansion. The benefit of such a design, <coughs> a design <coughs> is to give independent movement ability to the DIP joint apart from the simultaneous movement with the PIP joint. Therefore, all characteristics of coordinated movements for various group ta grasp tasks can be found in the clear corresponding ev evidences from muscular, articular, connective, articular, architecture of the human hand. These characteristics of coordinated movement reflect the basic functional requirements for dexterous performance of various tasks. And the muscular articular connective architecture of the human hand exactly meets such functional requirements. The hands work the way they're supposed to. This suggests that there is no need for the human hand to control each joint independently. A lot of the time your fingers will behave pretty much at this, uh, the same way. If there was not such biomechanical architecture, such as the separated connection of each articular from a single muscle, it would significantly increase the computational burden of the CNS to make up for the loss of bio biomechanical architecture. And it's a good thing that the hand is working pretty much together because you don't have to think so much when you're, when you're grabbing stuff. Thus, the architecture is the biomechanical basis for the dexterous movement that provides the human hand with the amazing ability to perform a multitude of uh, daily tasks in a comfortable way. Keep in mind that they have excluded playing the piano from this uh, analysis. In conclusion, our study can improve the understanding of the human mind and confirm that the mechanical architecture is the proper design by the creator for dexterous performance of numerous functions following the evolutionary remodeling of the ancestral hand for millions of years. Ah, this is a, yes. These, obviously these people believe in millions of years, right? And they believe in evolution. And at this point you're going, what? Well, we're, we're going to have some fun with that. Um, Moreover, functional explanations for the mechanical architecture of the muscular articular connection of the human hand can also aid in developing multifunctional robot hands by designing them with similar basic architecture. Okay. Now, the PLOS One staff could not stand for this. Um, you'll see why in a minute. And they wrote a retraction. And that retraction is on the internet. And it's also in front of the article. If you look for the article, it'll be in front of it. Um, the, uh, the text reads, following publication, readers raised concerns about language in the article that makes reference to a creator and about the overall rationale and findings of the study. Upon receiving these concerns, 
plus one editors have carried out an evaluation of the manuscript and pre-publication process, and they sought further advice on the work from experts in the editorial board. This evaluation con confirmed concerns within the scientific with the scientific rationale, presentation, and language. Now, I want you to notice that there's a problem with the rationale, presentation, as well as the language, which were not adequately d addressed during peer review. Consequently, the PLOS One editors consider that the work cannot be relied upon and retract this publication. The editors apologize to readers for the inappropriate language in the article and the errors during the evaluation process. Note errors plural, not just error. Uh, no hint as to what they are. I went and I had some fun uh, looking at the comments of the first article, of the article itself, and proper design by the creators. Statement. These are just titles, okay? And, and if you want to find out what they actually say, you have to uh, click on them. And, and so it's not, it's not your standard comment section. Uh, one of them, the authors must supply evidence or other form of proof to f support the creator hypothesis mentioned in the abstract. Scientific papers must not un invoke unsubstantiated claims as supporting statements. Well, that's one of the kinder ones. It's not acceptable to publish an article like this to be full of assertions about a creator, especially since it does nothing to back up this claim at all and just highlights a poor understanding of evolution by the authors and a very sloppy job done by both the reviewers and the editor. To salvage the reputation of this journal, this article should be retracted and the, and the future services of the reviewers and editor declined. They must be fired. Wow. Note that these people all declare that they have no competing interests. Um, now here's one that's interesting, I have competing interest, I am a scientist. <laughs> uh, which I thought was interesting. Um, it's, n let's see, um, I, this is the same one. It, it's really exciting to see Open Access Plus One trying out this new op-ed section. I can't wait to s see what will appear n next. And competing in interest to declare I am a scientist. There's no room in the scientific literature for intelligent design. This is more than just a language issue. Um, PubMed should suspend indexing PLOS One as should all other respectable scientific bibliographic sources. <whistles> My competing interest is to maintain the integrity of science. And that's entitled well for starters. And he wants to go beyond that, I guess? This one is interesting. See, they retract this article or I resign as an editor. That's right. We're not going to allow this. And uh, uh, here's somebody who's much concern has been expressed concerning the reference to the creator in this paper. Beyond this, I have strong concern about the fact that this reference is embedded in a text that contains many pompous sentences that were used to make hollow, self-contained, or obvious statements, which should have been enough to call for major rewriting. To make it clear, I think this would be good to trash this paper because of its flaws and references to the creator being only one of them. Well, that's good, because if it was just objecting to the creator, we might think that this is actually anti-religious prejudice. But obviously, there's way more wrong with the, with the paper than that. So what is wrong? A few sentences from the article. The clear link between the subject and the function of a human hand also suggests that the design of a multifunctional robotic hand should be able to better imitate such basic architectures. That's an inappropriate statement to make. You mean uh, if we make robot hands sort of like human hands, they might work better? Well, I thought evolution polished things off so that uh, it was a good design. Well, maybe not. The human hand is an amazing instrument that can perform a multitude of functions. I mean, that's just terrible to say. Um, while the abundant functions are favorable, this complex structure also, ra also raises a challenging problem of how the human body controls such a large number of mechanical degrees of freedom with ease and an absence of effort. But you just, you can't say things like that. That an organ performs its function, what kind of challenging problem is that? Amazing, ease and absence of effort ring a bell for the, as the authors are not fo focused on structure and function. 
Hand coordination should indicate the mystery of the creator's invention. Intro to first, uh, intro to first paragraph. Comments, since when in science performed at, to point at a mystery rather than bringing it into light piece by piece? This is faith speaking instead. If you ever admit that you don't know, then I guess you have faith and so therefore it's not science anymore. I, I'm not sure how you reason that one. This study explores a method to identify the proper explanation to the ha uh, hand, for the hand ar architecture of muscular articular connections from the analysis of behavioral result. Comment, looking for the best, most likely explanation, okay. Since when are we looking for the proper explanation as we do science? Remember, this is a, something being written in Chinese, okay? So um, obviously somebody really reacts to proper. And doing this for the structures of biological objects like muscular articular connections, what does it mean? As a biochemist, I cannot comment on analysis of behavioral result, except to say that it sounds as pompous and hollow as, as the rest to my untrained ears. Well, maybe there's a problem with the ears, all right. An important advantage that makes human hand superior to other animals is that human hand can dexterously perform various tasks, and this unique ability can apparently facilitate the capacity for more effective tool making and tool using during the evolutionary process. So we are not super superior to other animals in the use of our hands. I mean, we can't be, right? Whether human hand is superior to chimps is a question, not a fact. <laughs> What kind of information superior is conveying is always a good question to ask. Oh well. We adopted the reverse research method, going from the result to the reason. That's called reverse engineering, isn't it? Um, comment, is that reverse? How many research uh, methods are they uh, able to apply? From facts and context to interpretation, I know no other. That's called inferential. We guess we're not supposed to do that. My understanding of forward research from res reason to result is called fraud. This is a strong reminder that science is an opinion in the opinion of creationists. You see, so they must be really creationists and are really trying to destroy science. Having sampled this few sentences in a few minutes, I have strong concerns about the editing process, especially because the editor is based in Ohio. Ooh, where creationists are especially active. How come everybody wants this? Uh, how come everybody wants this paper down for using the word uh, referring to the creator when it's full of pretense? We can destroy the method and leave their beliefs alone, but we must be methodological in doing so. Finally, I dare say that style flaws are not typical of ID products. Style trade-offs have become common. Catchy titles, once confined to reviews, are now used for research papers themselves, and worse, biological objects are commonly endowed with intentions as they evolve. Hmm. Evolution did this, evolution did that. Well, maybe he's got a point there. Um, meet or perform their functions, even in good papers. Even in good papers, it just creeps in everywhere, design. It's just not fair. Using simple, truthful words as we describe our work is not only a personal choice, it's also a responsibility we shall stand for. Thank you for your attention. Okay. Horrifying. Creator, has this really been peer-reviewed by whom? Isn't that horrifying? Um, and now we get to threats. I will no longer submit to PLOS One, nor will I review any articles when asked to do, to do so. This latest debacle outrage is not the only reason. It's another in a long line of things that eroded my confidence. Makes me embarrassed to list PLOS papers in my CV. I feel particularly sorry for young researchers who have a small number of papers previously published here. Not even a retraction will make me change my mind. Bye-bye, PLOS. A response about the incorrect use of the word. This is by Ming Jin, who happens to be the lead author. We are sorry for drawing the debates about creationism. Our study has no relationship with creationism. English is not our native language. Well, the Our understanding of the word creator was not actually as a native English speaker expected. Now we realize that we misunderstood the word creator. 
What we would like to express is the biomechanical characteristic of tenderness connective architecture between muscles and our articulations is a proper design by the nature result of evolution to perform a multitude of daily grasping tasks. We will change the creator to nature in the revised manuscript. We apologize for any troubles caused, may have been caused by this misunderstanding. They weren't even intending to create a ruckus. Uh, oh, competing evidence interest declared. We are the authors of this paper. <laughs> ah, and then somebody said, actually, this article could be extremely important in the battle against creationism. The conclusion of the authors is their interpretation of the data, not necessarily something that the data actually show. But the publication of such an article clearly puts paid to the assertion that no creationists are allowed to present their findings in scientific journals. Now their conclusions can be dealt with by the scientific community and the whinging, I guess whining, um, about censorship it's, can itself be silenced. Oh, just leave it up. Don't censor it. Just leave it up. See, you can get in if you want to. Of course, y y if the peer reviewers are doing their job right, you won't be let in, but that's a different issue. Um, Sir Isaac Newton once said, the absence in, in the absence of any other proof, the thumb alone would convince me of God's existence. How is this possible? <laughs> oh, boy. Um, so, uh, moving on. Th uh, punishment or retraction? This retraction seems more like a punishment than a peer review concern. Although the reviewers may not have proofread the language of this work, but I presume that they've reviewed the scientific message of this work, which focused on the biomechanics of the hand. So they probably went right over the reviewers' heads. Uh, the question is that why PLOS One did not, that's an interesting way of phrasing, maybe this guy has English too, looks like it. Um, that why PLOS One did not give the authors this chance to revise the language while the scientific content of the paper is sound. So just let them change you know, a couple words and we'll be fine. Um, and here's somebody saying, the retraction of this article does not make any sense. English is my second slash third language, and to me it is clear as day that the authors wanted to use the word nature and not creator. Clearly, there are no insidious religious motivations for sneaking in the word creator. A cre creationist would not have mentioned millions of years of evolution in the same breath as the creator. Perhaps the editorial board needs to listen to Google Translate Sings videos on YouTube. Their lesson in how <laughs> hilariously terrible translations can sometimes be. And if you want to have fun, Google English, E-N-G-R-I-S-H. Um, it will leave your side splitting. Uh, <clears throat> retractions seem to have been done without consulting the authors. Oh, this is not good. The lead author, Kai Hong Xiong of Wazung University of Science and Technology in Wuhan, China, explained in the journal Nature, indeed we are not native speakers of English and entirely lost the connotations of such words as creator. I'm so sorry for that. Um, plus editors were unable to do what Nature did so easily. Contact the authors and ascertain that it is a translation error. Uh, question mark. Were they unable, I guess. Um, the entire paper's could have been corrected with three simple find and replace edits, replacing the creator with the word nature. Avoiding all this nonsense about creationism and the religious backlash from narrow blind, blinded minds. And both of these, no, no competing interests were declared. Um, uh, we're getting close to the end of this. Dear editors, creator is another metaphoric name for nature in Chinese. This is the other side of the story, which you and most of the people condemning the paper do not see. To put it simply, in the long history of China, there, were very, there was rarely any period of time that any sort of religion or atheism was considered a sin at all. The Chinese, unlike the Europeans, has never initiated war or crusade against any belief system. Therefore, unlike, unlike the European, and I'm sure that is, we did not need sacrifices. When you say we, I'm assuming he's Chinese too. We did not need sacrifices or even science to embrace the idea of religious tolerance. It has always been a tradition ingrained in our culture and language. Using creator as a metaphor for Mother Nature, 
it is a way, it is a way, I'm sorry, of saying regardless of what you believe in, you need to see the wonder in this masterpiece. I can instantly tell that the author is intended to say from a native speaker's perspective and from someone who has worked in the field of linguistics and neurolinguistics for a little while. The point of this incident, in my opinion, is to open the discussion of how people write in good standard English in the peer review process, not to push them away from the English publishing world. I do think the authors should apologize, but retracting the paper and condemning them is crude and unnecessary. It has become a bully, not an education. Last but not least, I do think escalation of this whole incident is partly due to the ignorance of the Western Internet world. I do not want to say cultural discrimination because most of the people are not intentional. But I think that many people have cultural ignorance. Just because they think the word created definitely has 100% religious connotation and has perfect correlation with creationism, the rest of the world must define the world in the same way. In fact, the majority of Chinese people are atheists. This is exactly the reason that we are not as sensitive as Westerners are to the word creator. Because we do not fear that the creationism will come back. We never believed it in the first place. Uh, I need to say that this ignorance and verbal condemnation on the internet coerced the editors of PLOS One to make the decisions. A lot of people said a lot of hurtful things toward phenomena that they do not even understand. Thank you. Um, this, uh, two comments on the uh, retraction and then we'll, we'll uh, sum it up and, uh, and open it up. By retracting this article for inappropriate language, you've just shown the world exactly how far behind the Iron Curtain a, the world of secular academia has now fallen. Thank you so much because you've just provided incontrovertible evidence to the world that free debate and exchange is not open on the topic of the Creator, and any reference to a Creator will not be tolerated. Um, and finally, I admire the fast reaction of the PLOS staff. However, at the same time, it also means that the decision, I'm sure that was what it is, is made in a very short period of time. In this retraction note, it is vaguely state, said that there are concerns with the scientific rationale presentation and language. Could you please explain what exactly are those, these concerns, presumably besides creator? From another source, of the For Better Science blog, I've learned that the retraction of this paper is not solely on language issue. There were issues with the rationale and presentation of the findings that were not adequately addressed during peer review. It confuses me. Does it mean that the reviewers did not adequately raise these questions and concerns? Or did the authors fail to address the reviewers' questions, but the editor still accepted this manuscript? In any case, I don't think it is the author's fault. I hope that PLOS could verify, clarify the vague st uh, statement and make this whole, make the whole process transparent. Best regards, Xin. Anyway, my take. As the signs used to say in some establishment, no Irish need apply, it's probably appropriate to say no creator need apply, even accidentally. Correction is not enough, only full retraction will do. The behavior, I think, is revealing. Those who are confident of prevailing do not have to resort to censorship. But that's my opinion. Now it's your turn. Yes. <laughs> so. An interesting, very interesting presentation and uh, tells us about uh, the prejudice that is out there. Uh, I think we need to look at this from the broader perspective that uh, you can do a lot of science without invoking the creator into your science. It's easy to, to invoke the creator or evolution because you wonder how things came about. Uh, on the other hand, when you get involved in asking that question, which is so often done in biology, biological articles, uh, you face the fact that uh, science is exhibiting a bias that need not be there. Now, I say that because 
science, modern science, developed in a theistic context, a strongly theistic context. As in Newton's quote. Newton, he mentioned Bol, uh, Boyle, Pascal, uh, Galileo, uh, these founders of modern science who actually emancipated science from a lot of prejudice often referred to God in their writings and so on. They did very good science. You can do very good science when you include God in the picture. But in the last two centuries, science has emancipated, probably a century and a half is a better term, better evaluation, has emancipated itself from any idea of a creator, and as such it has, it has sealed itself into a little box that will not ask you, allow you to ask properly the question, how did this come about? And I think this article demonstrates that that box is absolutely ironclad. It, it, it's unbelievable, and it's unbelievable that such a great percentage of the scientific community, community should follow that. Now, the strange paradox here is that while this is the pattern that you follow if you're a scientist, you don't mention God and all this stuff in your literature, a Pew Research study about two years ago pointed out that more than half, and I must say it's not very much more, it's 51 percent, of scientists believe in either a god or a supreme being type thing. We can state on the basis of that, the, the pattern that science now has of excluding god from its interpretations is not followed by the majority of the scientists. Uh, science is a sociological and phenomenon, uh, and I dare say, it's an atheistic sociological phenomenon. It's not a search for open truth for search. What if God exists? They have no right to exclude that. It's a closed system. Yes. I'm amused as an editor understanding the so-called peer review business. They really, really, really missed it. <laughs> the other thing that happened is that evidently these Chinese people used the uh, Google Translator. <laughs> and that's again <laughs> funny. <laughs> Well, you've had some experience with uh, dealing with non-English publications too, right? <laughs> it's just, um, I don't know if you've ever seen um, the Star War. That's the singular. It's what had happened was that Star Wars got translated into Chinese and then some enterprising person retranslated from Chinese back into English. And it gets very amusing. <laughs> Translation is funny. <laughs> anyway, so I, I'm sure these guys did it totally innocently. Uh, and what I'm wondering is maybe the reviewers were also Chinese and it just went right over their heads. <laughs> Anyway. Yeah, I, I was just wondering about uh, people posting the complaints about um, the creator comments. I was wondering if you think there are just a small minority who are afraid of creation creeping into science, or is this what the majority of the readers think? It's probably a, small, uh, a large but vocal minority. Studies that have been done, among the other things, show that in, in scientists in general, um, and PLOS One is a general science journal, so this is probably a fair place to, to look for it, that approximately 
um, do not believe in God affirmatively. And, and the question was asked, do you believe in a God that answers prayer? So we're not talking about you know, some mystical force out there that might have started the Big Bang. This is so, somebody that you can actually communicate with. Approximately 40% do. That's probably a little more restrictive than the statistics you were giving, because this is a this is an actual interventionist God rather than a uh, rather than just some kind of God, and forty uh, percent do, and fifteen percent are undecided. Well, I mean, you can see the problem coming because you shift five percent from the do not believe to the do believe, and suddenly they're they, they're now no longer the uh, plurality. So I think these people are paranoid. I think they are, they are seeing that you know, this, uh, they could lose their control over science. And that's why you see such vigor. I mean, in China, probably laid back, you know, whatever. And uh, you know, if you're a Christian and you wrote the creator, you put the character that could mean the creator in nature, and people would just kind of whatever, you know, move on. And uh, if you were a... Uh, Creationists, you wouldn't put the millions of years in, but other than that, you know, that would, the article would sound pretty much the same. Yeah. Well, I don't think that they're thinking of the creator. I think that they're they're probably atheists, just like every, you know, or like a large number of people in China are. That I I suspect the majority after Mao and his group have gone through, you know. Um, and so uh, they, they're, not, they're not even fighting this battle. It, the, the, they're using traditional language. And there's another source that I didn't uh, put up there that, that mentions that the same character can be translated as nature or the creator. And the creator is a more specific translation in that it is uh, it's a, uh, the, the it's a, it's related to the verb create, but that you know, and traditionally it has come to mean nature, and so you know they just put the character in and they translated it the way probably Google. Uh, Two other things about that. You, you know, it's uh, well, like I say, it's English. There's no question about that. You know, but. Uh, that's you know that's probably what we're looking at, and it's just <laughs> people just need to be not quite so uh, uptight about it. But obviously they are, and it, you know it's to the point. Well, see what it is is we're messing with scripture. Once you understand that, it makes perfect sense, because the peer-reviewed literature is the ultimate authority. And they got a creator into the peer-reviewed literature. This just cannot stand. Anyway, here, here, and we got a bunch of other hands. Yeah, it's amazing that I can't go anywhere without having evolution inserted into the comments on something or read any article. And if I got offended every time somebody threw that into our, their article and failed to look at the rest of the article to see if they had good science in it that I could learn from, I'd be really limiting. So it's amazing that they can be so offended that they cannot be educated or learn anything. This is a little one-sided, and I'm still waiting for to to see what those comments, you know, what those terrible things that they missed besides the word creator was. I, I suspect that uh, that that the word creator kind of blurred across the whole page and covered everything up. Yes. Uh -huh. Yeah, the critics of this the critics of this paper have managed to unsettle my normally pleasant disposition. Um, <laughs> I would submit that one does not the first thing that, that the authors did was to apologize. You know, one does not need to apologize to a, a people who are committed naturalists whose crit critique can be shown, and I mean demonstrably shown, to presuppose a worldview which is not scientific at all, but purely speculative metaphysics. Although they would dispute that. Oh, sure, but, I, but that can be shown, I think. Yeah. In the, in, since the work of good, Kurt Gödel, there can be simply no such thing as a scientific worldview, because science uh, doesn't deal with worldviews. It's a it, meta-narrative. 
it's a, science is not a meta narrative in that uh, sense, and they're making it one. Yes, yes. Uh, I think you're precisely right about that. Uh, anyway, comment here, and we've got one yeah. way over there. I, I've, I've had an interesting time working with uh, Chinese painting, and as such, uh, the different uh, characters of the Chinese language are more of a pictograph type of a character, and as such, it's amazing how many different meanings each one of those pictographs can actually represent, because they're not they're not a, a close close meaning like we have in the English language. One one of those characters can have multiple meanings to it, and that's why they could be very very can very very acceptable for them to look at creator and nature as being entirely equivalent meanings for that character. Well, uh, even in English we have multiple meanings for one word. Sure. Uh, and, and sometimes they grow out of each other and sometimes they're so far distant that you can't really tell. The word bug is a good example. Bug is a original little creepy crawly. It later got restricted in entomology to a small creepy crawly with mouthpieces and, of course, in, in the insect family, so it's six legs and so forth. Um, and one pair of wings that's, uh, that's diaphanous and that crosses over on itself. So assassin bug is a bug. Ladybug is actually a beetle. Okay? Um, and then it got, it got worse than that. There was a moth that got fried in one of the uh, computers early on. And so now they refer, refer to programs, uh, program errors as bugs. And so you have to debug the computer. And uh, then a bug came to mean something generally bad with something. So, you know, you have a bug in whatever, you know. Yeah, say, don't, don't bug me. Yeah, leading, leading, to, leading to the old joke of um, uh, the... Um, Man calls the waiter over and says, waiter, there's a bug in my soup. And the waiter says, that's not a bug, it's a feature. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, it's a comment of... Well, this, uh, is this thing working? Yeah, it is now. Uh, this reminds me of something that happened to me 30 years ago. And psy psychologist was looking at it and and somebody said, well, your test came out very annoyed. And uh, she knew the situation. She says, well, so I realized that uh, any normal person has happening to them, to, uh, has happening to them, what's happening to you, would be a little paranoid. So that's just normal. But these people are not normal at all. If they, I think if you check them out psychologically, this is all par, par, kind of parable in a sense. But I think that they actually are displaying mental illness. They're taking their paranoia so extreme that they're not normal at all. Well, I, beyond I, that. Well, I think that we have to be a little bit careful, and, and, and that is that I would not say they're not normal. I would say they are exhibiting behavior that is not rational, which is... A, a little bit different because in many other relationships they may be normal, but 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 uh, in this particular area it 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 flips a switch where they're not uh, where they where they do exhibit behavior that is more characteristic of paranoid people in general. Uh, I say that advisedly because I once got. Uh, listed over the internet for, for using the word paranoid, especially since I'm a physician and uh, I was diagnosing without seeing the patient and whatever. Uh, but uh, uh, but it, there is also a point to that, and that, that is that it's not fair to characterize a person throughout all his or her relationships by one. Uh, and there may be some things that are hitting a particularly raw nerve and so they're acting in a particular way, but that doesn't mean that they're paranoid all the way around. Although, for some of them that may be true, we, uh, at least at this point we don't have evidence that that's true. Well, I think, I think they, have a problem. well uh, they, they do have a problem with creationism, that's for sure. 
They have a problem with creationism, yes. I'll take a slightly different tact. I think this is a very poor example of uh, something for us as creationists to stake our reputations on. I think this paper shouldn't have been published. Uh, I review a fair number of manuscripts for scientific journals, and I certainly would not have accepted this one. There, it's filled with problems that the reviewers should have raised. There was no hypothesis stated for one thing. There was no data ever given in the abstract. Um, the language throughout was problematic, and at the very least should have been rewritten by the authors. So I don't think this is a very good example. Uh, I think people got upset about the word creationism and lost sight of the fact that the paper was terrible to begin with. Well, I, I would agree with you. I think there are some, there are some uh, defects that could be corrected in the paper. I, I think there is one point, though, that, that but is... But that's a problem that the, from, for the editors and the, and the reviewers. Right. That they should be ashamed to publish something well, that... Uh, well, but there's... Without there, adequate review. There, there's another point that I think is really important, and that is that if you are going with the grain, there's a lot of stuff that can be published that's, uh, shall we say, less than stellar quality. But... If you are going against the grain, suddenly the fine tooth comb comes out and every nit that can possibly be picked is picked. Well, it wasn't just because of that. It's just because the, the whole paper is No, no. Flawed. I mean, you're correct in that, in that there are flaws in the paper that could be, that could be improved. You pointed out one of, the, one of the statistical problems as you went through it. And yeah. There's likely more. But the point is that there is a disparate attention paid to. I agree. And, and this, is the, this is the thing that's important. If, if a creationist publishes a paper and they know he's a creationist, and even if he doesn't say the word creator, he's going to get that thing picked to death. Whereas, the, the, whereas somebody who is not a creationist or, or who is not known as a creationist could just, you know, kind of, Go with the flow and uh, whatever, and you can get it in plus one. That may be true, but I think this is a poor example to uh, just because it was so poorly done by evolutionists to boot. Yeah, well, it, it is an example that shows that peer review doesn't catch everything. I think that's fair. That is. And, uh, and I think that that's really important is that we can't just, we can't just, uh, assume that if something is peer-reviewed, therefore it is true. And, and of course, vice versa, we can't assume that if something is not peer-reviewed, it is therefore false. And I think this is the, and especially not by the right peer reviewers. Uh, and I think that this is a really important point that, that peer review is not an adequate defense against creationism because it's biased. Okay, we have a comment here and then one over here. Can we get that? Go ahead. Uh, English is my third language, and I have been called on to review some manuscripts from time to time. And when these manuscripts have come from, shall we say, non-English origin countries, and I pointed out that they need to correct their English, in numerous places, and I would give examples and such. The editor would suggest that I was being unnecessarily uh, sharp, and I was really serving to restrict those who do not have the same privileges, being from various other places, uh, to have access to publish in scientific literature. So I have been more or less forced by nature of things to focus more intently on the actual science and some of the more obvious misspeaks. But I'm in the context of that also curious wouldn't Chinese language that uses a lot of the pictograms possibly uh, use the same word for creator as well as nature? 
Well, yes. Yeah, that's right. Yes. Uh, well, so th that th would therefore explain why the translation mm -hmm. somehow just got it the way it did it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then everybody yeah. just and 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 and. <laughs> To Chinese, so, so if you want, if you want to, to Chinese have who read it, they wouldn't even bat an eye. They understand well, what it means. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. That's why I say it probably had a Chinese reviewer, and, yes. the, and for him, the, the psh, went that right was, over his that head. That was just good. Yes. Um, so next time you want somebody to pick apart somebody's English language, just insert the word creator a couple times, and they'll <laughs> pay attention. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, what you were saying about I, to me, I relate this as something like a religion and a culture, the scientific world. Having worked at a religious magazine, uh, too, if uh, it, it's editing and everything, if there's something that's just a tiny bit off that may be not in line with um, the denomination or something like that, uh, it can be very well turned down, or you get a lot of letters, that sort of thing. So uh, it is very much, to me, like a culture or religion. And uh, we're in the same boat when we're thinking about our own culture and religion. Uh, we want to defend it. Also, I wanted the name of that magazine again and the date of it. That, um, that was. Do you get the email? Uh, yeah, was it in there? It, it's, oh, it's okay. in there in the references. Okay, then I have In fact, the, the link is in the references, so you can just click on it oh, and get there. okay. Yeah, so you see what I'm saying? It's, it's just yeah. part of, if every horse you see is purple and you think all horses are purple, it's kind of a pure thing. No, I agree with you. I think that, I think that what's happening here is that the underlying religious nature of the controversy is coming out. Because if it was just purely scientific, people would say, well, you know, fix the words. Maybe fix this, maybe fix that, and redo it. And they've been through years of study on this, and I mean, how can they think any differently? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I, I think it is a perfect illustration that even if you accidentally say the word creator, you're in big trouble in science. And, and may I suggest, <laughs> it's not even the word creator, even if you accidentally mention the word design. Yes, which you notice they had, had uh, no in, in the paper. creator or anything like yeah. that. See, now the other aspect of this p particular paper, notice that they're thinking in terms of what features need to be somehow incorporated in the design of robotics. Right. They're, that's what they're interested. Now, since when are the people who are designing robots particularly interested in religions? Not generally. And, no. And, you know, what probably happened is it was intended for an entirely different audience, and that's oh, why absolutely. that's why the first comment that I can see is in like March 3, and the paper is like published in January. So apparently like for two months, you know, people just kind of whatever, and then all of a sudden, well, oh, they're saying that? No, 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 but you see, what happened the first month, there were only a few dozen people who read the paper. Second month, the same thing. Third month, 200 and plus thousand people read it. <laughs> yeah, if you want to get your paper read, you put the word creator in it. There we go. <laughs> uh, okay. <laughs> oh, one, one more comment here, I think. I think it would be interesting if we decided that since obviously having a creator is so bad that the people designing the robotic hands shouldn't be allowed to actually create something. They need to have some kind of random process to see if they can come up with a hand. There you go. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, next week come back and we'll get back to the Bible.